And tonight I'd like us to focus on what the Bible says about our nature as human beings and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that this physical world is good and that we should enjoy everything that God has created in a righteous way. Uh, going all the way back to uh, the book of Genesis where we read about creation, the Bible says God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Genesis 1, verse 31. And so God looked upon his entire creation, and the Bible tells us it was very good. And so it's amazing and a wonderful thing to live in this, this present world. Um, you know, some people have this, you know, kind of picture idea about Christians that we're all about kind of those who don't believe in, in God and Christianity, that we're all about, you know, pie in the sky, and, you know, we're just only focused on, on heaven. And, you know, it's true that heaven, of course, should be a, a focus of ours, but it is uh, not true that that's our only focus. You know, the Bible teaches we should love life here and now. Uh, we should love what God has provided um, here and now and also have a love for the future and the promises uh, of heaven. If you have your Bible, please open it with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be reading from there tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to talk on the following three points found in the first several verses of this chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Number one, live with hope. Number two, live for God. And number three, live prepared. Paul wrote to the Christians at Corinth about living here and now, living in this present world, but he also wrote about the desire to live with God and be in heaven one day when the time comes. Let us walk by faith, not by sight. So we're going to begin in verses 1 through 4. Again, if you'd like to follow along, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And the Bible says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit." So here in verses uh, 1 and following, especially here in verse 1, we find a contrast. Uh, in verse 1, it mentions a tabernacle, all right, or a, a, we might say tent today is a more common, uh, a common word, but we have a, a tabernacle in contrast to a building, all right, a tabernacle or a tent in contrast to uh, a building. And uh, a tabernacle is, uh, generally speaking, a temporary structure, a movable uh, structure. And we can even think about the tabernacle um, in the Old Testament when the, the nation of Israel was in the wilderness. You know, the tribe of Levi, the priests, they would set up the tabernacle and they would worship. And then when God would lead them from that spot, they would pack it up and they would move the tabernacle. And so here in verse 1, it speaks about a, a tabernacle, a tent, again, a temporary movable structure in contrast to a building, right? A building being the very opposite, a building being a permanent structure, one that's not going to um, go anywhere. And in this whole context, what Paul is describing is our current state of being, you know, here and now, uh, represented by the tabernacle. Our body here and now, our physical bodies are pictured as a tent, as a tabernacle. Whereas when he talks about this building and that we have this desire to receive this building uh, from God, looking at verse 1, uh, the end of verse, kind of the middle of verse 1, 
We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Here he's talking about our next state of existence, our eternal state of existence, uh, what the Bible in, in more clear passages calls the resurrection, that one day we're going to be resurrected to live uh, eternally. So here we have this, this, these contrasts of living here and now with our mortal bodies, uh, our bodies which grow old and decay, and one, way, one day we'll return to the dust in contrast to that eternal building which will come uh, from God. Now if we look at verse 2, notice how it describes how we should desire this eternal building, this home uh, in heaven. In verse 2 it says, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring. Now, so this is a earnest desire. This is a strong desire that we should have as, uh, as Christians. Uh, that this is the hope that we should have. Uh, this is what we should be looking forward to in our lives, uh, this home one day in heaven. This passage reminds us that we are not meant to live in this world forever. Uh, it speaks about us groaning. You know, in this present life, I know I'm not that old. Uh, I'm kind of on the younger side, I guess. But, you know, knocks and bruises and things like that hurt. And we get a little bit older and we don't heal as quickly and, and things like that. So he speaks about us growing, You're going through the, the pains of life, the physical pains uh, of life. And if we look at verse 4, he says, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. So again, this is a metaphor describing here and now the present physical bodies that we have. So we in, in this tabernacle do groan. He says, being burdened. Not that we, we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. That mortality might be swallowed up in life. So, you know, you know here's, a, I think, a, a good point to, to think about. We should never wish for, you know, death. We should never want to harm anyone or harm ourselves thinking, well, hey, we're going to get to heaven quicker. Um, but there is, again, this hope we have that when our life is over, that we're going to be clothed upon with immortality. Death is a means to an end. It's not an end itself. And so we should look forward to being clothed upon, receiving that eternal building from God, the resurrection. And so we live with this hope. We live with this expectation uh, that the Bible promises. Uh, this also means that we live for God, that we trust in him and that we trust in his word, uh, that we endeavor to do what is right by our Holy Father. Um, let's continue with verses 5 and following. I'd like to read verse 5 one, uh, one more time, verses 5 through 9. It says, Now he that hath wrought us for this selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now, in verse 5, I'm reading from the King James. It says, He that wrought us for this selfsame thing. The New King James is a, a little clear. It says, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God. So God has wrought us, or God has prepared us, for this very thing. And this is referring back to the previous verse, the end of verse 4, uh, where it says mortality might be swallowed up by life. Mortality might be swallowed up by life. So again, this idea that one day we're going to live forever, free of pain and suffering, free from the physical limitations of this body. And then we come to verse 5, he that wrought or he that prepared us for this, this immortality, is God himself. God has prepared an everlasting home for us, an everlasting existence for us, where we can be with him and be with all those who are faithful. 
Our life here and now is important. You know, again, we should love life and we should enjoy this world and enjoy all the pleasures of this world. Um, but that's not all there is to our existence. Uh, this present world is not the summation of our lives. Uh, one day, mortality will be swallowed up of life, and we will live forever. Uh, verse 5 mentions the earnest of the Spirit. Again, verse 5 says, Now he that wrought us for this selfsame thing is God, who's also given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. This is mentioned earlier in the book. Let's go back to chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 22, it says, Who hath also sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. And so this word earnest being used here, this is a financial term, and it means a down payment. That God has made a down payment, and this down payment consists of the Spirit. God has given the, the Spirit as a down payment. And he's given it to the church. And there's, I think, some several important meanings. I think one of the most important things being described here is that the, the miracles, wonders, and signs that were done by the early church in the, in the first century, uh, this was evidence that God would finish what he started. Uh, God uh, showing his sign of approval for those who are Christians this New Testament that he's given uh, the world and that he's going to finish what he has started. He has made a down payment on the church, and one day he will claim his people in full. He will take us home so we can be where he is. And so he's given us, again, that earnest of the Spirit. Um, and that passage we just read talks about the earnest of the Spirit um, in our hearts. And so the same kind of faith, the the early church had, the ancient church had, we can have that same faith. Uh, we can have that same kind of, of heart. Um, let's go back to chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6, after he speaks about the earnest of the Spirit. In verse 6, he says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, this is an important verse. You know, some people talk about Jesus meeting with them, Jesus giving them a message, and so on. But here it says, while we're here, here in the Bible says, while we're living in this present world, while we're in this body, we are absent from the Lord. Uh, we are separated from uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So while we're here, here and now, uh, we are absent from the Lord. The Bible says Jesus Christ will return someday. And until that day comes, uh, in a certain sense, we are absent from him. Now, Jesus is you know, part of the Godhead. You know, he knows everything in a certain sense. He's also omnipresent. But as far as him being here in a tangible way where we can see him like the apostles saw him and him communicate with us that way, that no longer happens today. And this verse is, you know, again, very clear about that, that while we're here, we're absent from the Lord. Now, considering the context we've read so far, look at verse 7. Verse 7, I think, is a, a fairly well-known verse. It says, we walk by faith, not by sight. And uh, this is a verse which I think is, is often taken out of context, and people will use it to mean, you know, all kinds of things. Um, you know, going by the lottery ticket, hey, I walk by faith, not by sight. Hopefully, I'll win the lottery, you know. That's not what this verse means. You know, people... Uh, we'll use this verse basically meaning that they have hope in anything that they uh, are not sure about. And there's, again, a, there's a specific context here in what Paul is, is writing to the church at, uh, at Corinth. Uh, he says, we walk by faith. And this is a common figure used many times in the New Testament describe, describing how we live, how we conduct ourselves, uh, the New Testament teaches we do not walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit, Romans 8, verse 1, uh, that we do not walk in craftiness, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2. Uh, we're told to walk in love, walk in love, Ephesians 5, verse 2. Uh, we walk according to His commandments, 2 John 1, verse 6. And that's just a few 
of the many times we find this idea of walking. And of course, this is not talking about, you know, literally walking. How would you literally walk in love, right? So again, this is a figure talking about how we live, how we um, interact with people, especially one another's brethren, but with all people that we are to walk in, in love and so on. And so here we're, we're reminded we are to walk by faith, that we are to live lives of faith. And the passage we're looking at tonight, and it says we walk by faith, not by sight. Not by sight. If you would keep your Bible marked in 2 Corinthians, and let's go to 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. We walk by faith, not by sight. Now, so far in the context of 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul has talked essentially about heaven and the resurrection and looking forward to immortality one day. Have we ever seen those things? And he also mentions the Lord as well. Have we ever seen Jesus Christ in the flesh? Have we ever seen what immortality looks like, what heaven looks like? You know, we've never seen those things. We've never experienced them with our, with our senses. And so we must receive what the Bible is teaching here. We must receive these ideas by faith, by, by trusting in what is, uh, is written. And even though we today have not seen Jesus Christ and, and seen many of the things that you know, Paul is describing, uh, the inspired writers of the New Testament, they did see Jesus and uh, I love how John begins his, uh, his epistle here in 1 John. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and following. That which was from the beginning which we have heard. And notice all the, again, the physical senses that he describes. That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. And notice word is capitalized, right? Because in, especially in John's writings, uh, word is a name of, for Jesus. This is a, a name of Jesus. He's the word. Uh, the word of life. So he's talking about being with Christ, physically being with Christ, interacting with Christ. And then in verse 2 he says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so John here, in very detailed language, talks about how he was with Jesus and experienced Jesus with all his senses. And again, if we trust in the Bible, the Apostle John was a man who lived with Jesus, ate with Jesus, probably... I should say probably, but you know, listen to Jesus teach on many occasions. He was there to experience Christ. And notice he says, we have seen it and bear witness. What we have in the New Testament is the witness of men like John, inspired men like the Apostle John. We have seen it and bear witness. I do believe the we there in all likelihood is including himself and the other apostles, that John and the other apostles were with Jesus and bore witness to him. Um, very quickly, consider Peter's comments in uh, his second epistle, 2 Peter 1.16. The apostle Peter says, We have not followed cunningly devised fables. We made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his Majesty, And if you look at this context, he's specifically talking about a miraculous event. When Jesus was transfigured on the mount, when his, when his appearance was transformed before Peter, James, and John. And Peter's saying, this isn't some kind of fable. You know, this isn't some kind of myth. He's saying he actually witnessed Jesus be transformed before his uh, very eyes. And so here we have, you know, just two of the apostles and what quickly read what two of the apostles have said. Um, but again, they've claimed that they're bearing witness, that they're giving us their eyewitness testimony. We read the Bible, we study it, 
And by faith we receive the witness of these inspired men. Men who lived with Jesus and record the details about his life and ministry um, in the New Testament. And so when it says we walk by faith, not by sight, you know, faith is not just a, a, a belief where there's no evidence, no kind of support. You know, some people believe faith is like that. You know, if you have faith in God, it's just based on absolutely nothing. Well, again, that's not true. We have eyewitness testimony from these men. And you can either accept that claim or, or deny it, but that's the claim they made, that this is their eyewitness uh, account. And so when we look at the inspired teachings of the New Testament, uh, we read about the, the day of judgment. We read about heaven and, and hell. And these are things that we accept on faith. And so we live according to what the New Testament says. Uh, we live lives prepared uh, for the time we pass on from this, this world. I'd like us to read two more verses. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll read verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11, 2 Corinthians 5. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. And so here we are told we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And all here means all. It's not just all Christians or all believers, but it means everyone. Uh, all people must appear before the tribunal of Christ where he's going to judge the world. The only people who should fear this time of judgment are those who lack faith. And uh, we as Christians should uh, really have resolve on this. You know, we shouldn't, have, we shouldn't have this idea, well, I hope of going to heaven one day. You know, if we have faith in God, then we should have a, a, a strong faith that we are going to be uh, blessed in the hereafter. I humbly ask for your personal consideration. Do you have faith in Christ? Do you have faith in God? And if you can honestly answer yes, there is no reason you should be afraid of the day of judgment. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So again, I can just humbly ask for your personal consideration. Are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Have you believed and obeyed the gospel? Have you been baptized into Christ? Baptized in the one body, into his church? And if you are in Christ, and the Bible plainly says there's no condemnation for you. You know, the, 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 uh, uh, I lost the word all of a sudden. You're justified. You're declared not guilty. No condemnation uh, in Christ. Paul's emphasis throughout the beginning of chapter 5 is trusting in God again, while we're alive here and now, while we're alive in this present body. And so we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith so we can have the hope of heaven. If heaven and hell are real, and the Bible teaches they are indeed real, then your choices have eternal consequences. To put it another way, your life has meaning. Your life has purpose. Now, for those who are uh, atheists in our country uh, or espouse you know, atheistic ideas, uh, atheists do not believe there's any meaning to life. There's no soul. There's no spirit. There's no kind of God or gods. There's nothing beyond the physical. And so, you know, atheists believe that when you die, I mean, that's it. You're just, to put it bluntly, you're just warm food. And there's nothing beyond this present world. There's no meaning in life. There's no real purpose in life. And someone might ask, well, what's the appeal of that? Why would anyone want to be an atheist if life has no meaning, if life has no purpose? That seems rather depressing. 
And I believe it is you know, very depressing and sad, and most of all, I believe it's not true. But if there's no meaning to life, then there's no consequences. You know, your choices have no consequences. If you do good, if you do bad, it doesn't matter. And so that appeals to, to some people because some people don't want to follow the morality of the Bible. They want to sleep with whoever they want to sleep with, eat and drink whatever they want to drink, and so on, and think that nothing really matters, that there's no consequences in the end. And that can be, I think, especially appealing to, uh, well, really anyone, but especially a young person. Uh, but again, the, the idea of that is there's no meaning to your life. And uh, that's a very depressing way to, to live life and, and view the world. Uh, the Bible teaches everyone will stand before Christ one day, and we will be judged based on the choices that we make here and now, good or, good or bad. Um, let me point out one thing regarding verse 10, where it says we must all appear before the judgment of the seat of Christ. And notice here, the Bible is very specific in how it's worded. It says that everyone may receive the things done in his body, right, in his body, according to that he hath done, right? So one day when I pass, just use myself as, as an illustration, when I pass away, I'm going to be judged based on things I've done in this body, what I have done, what I have done in, in the past. So I'm going to be judged based on my choices. And you know, this, is a, this is important because there's, there's some people who have all these ideas about, you know, when you die, you might go to limbo, and there's all these kinds of second chances and so on. You know, if our choices have meaning they're, they're, and purpose, there has to come a point one day where we reap what we sow. And, and some people, even some Christians, cl people who claim to be Christians, they don't like that idea, and so they always want second chances. And there's all these teachings, again, about, you know, second chances and so on. But again, when you look at the language, how it's worded here, it's very specific. We're going to be stand and receive the things done in the body according to what we have done. Again, he says, good or bad, right? Good or bad. One way or the other. It's, it's, it's going to be one way or the other. Um, so again, very uh, specific uh, language. And this can be encouraging, right? He does in the next verse mention the fear of the Lord or the terror of the Lord. And I'll come back to that, but let's focus on the positive first. Uh, because there is some encouragement in this uh, passage. There's positivity um, in this passage. As I said before, if you're faithful, you should not fear the day of judgment. If you are in Christ, there's no condemnation. You should not be afraid of the day uh, of judgment. In Matthew 25, we're given an illustration of that great day, and we're told that all nations will appear before the Son of Man. Again, the Bible is specific. It's not just Christians or Jews. All nations will appear before the Son of Man. And he will divide those nations as a shepherd divides the, let me get the sides right, the sheep from the goats, right? Because the sheep are going to be on his right hand, the goats will be on the left. And in that description of the day of judgment, the Bible says in Matthew 25, 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now that's good, right? That's encouraging, isn't it? And this is regarding the day of judgment. And so again, the day of judgment, if we have uh, faith and we have the right perspective, it's going to be an encouraging day a day of rejoicing. So as I said before, the only people who should be afraid of the judgment of Christ are those who lack faith, uh, those who are not in Christ. And when we go back to 2 Corinthians 5 and we look at verse 11, uh, here it does mention the terror of the Lord. The King James used the word terror. Some other translations will say fear. In verse 11, it says, knowing therefore that the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. No matter what we do, we're always made manifest to God, right? He knows everything, and that's why uh, 
our Lord God can fairly judge the world because there's no deceiving him. Uh, he knows all. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You know, how should we respond to the gospel of Christ? And I think the best answer is uh, a healthy balance of fear and love. Jesus is not some cream puff, and neither is he a merciless tyrant who has absolutely no compassion and no patience. Uh, in Romans 11, verse 22, it says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. Right? And the verse continues talking about his goodness and severity. And so the Bible teaches us that God is good. That's a true statement. The Bible also teaches us that God is severe. Right? That he is strict sometimes. And that is also true uh, as well. You know, one does not negate the other or trump the other. God is simultaneously good and severe. So again, how should we respond to him? Well, because of his goodness, we should respond to him in love. But because of his severity, we should respond with, with fear or respect. And there is a balance I think we can have uh, regarding those, those two things. A healthy balance of fear and love. And so, you know, Paul again here is ultimately talking about eternity, talking about the choices we make here and now, and preparing ourselves for a life beyond this world. You know, have you ever had a near-death experience? Uh, have you ever been to a funeral? You know, being, uh, being to a, a funeral, uh, especially if someone that you know, uh, can really put things in, in perspective. The certainty of our mortality can be quite sobering. And, you know, we shouldn't constantly think about death. I'm not saying that. But it is something that we should ponder on occasionally. Um, the Bible says it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 12. The strong, the healthy, the powerful, the famous, the rich, the influential, one day we're all going to end up in the house of mourning, right? The funeral home is what he's talking about, really. Uh, and, and knowing this, how are we using the limited amount of time that we have? Are we walking by faith? Are we living lives of faith? Do we have the love? Are we showing the love that God wants us to have? Do we have the forgiveness and compassion that he wants us to have? Are we living lives of happiness and peace? God wants that from us as well. And when we look at you know, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11, this is a verse which speaks about the judgment one day and the terror of the Lord. The terror of the Lord. It's going to be a terrifying thing for a person to stand unprepared to meet their Creator. Let us live in such a way that we are prepared for that momentous occasion. Considering what we've read here in 2 Corinthians 5, may we live with hope, live for God, and live prepared. The Bible gives us this picture of a tent, you know, saying that this, this present body is like a tent, right? And if you've ever gone camping or used a tent, you know, you want to take care of your tent, of course, but that's not the most important thing. You're the most important thing, right? The person who actually is using the tent uh, for shelter, uh, the person abiding within the tent, that's what's most important, that inner person. Today, there's a lot of importance placed on the physical, uh, what kind of shape we are in, how we dress, how we, for the ladies, how we use makeup, or maybe how we style our hair, or how we shave, or whatever it is, and uh, it goes on and on and on and on, and you know, lots of people, they don't want you to be happy with your physical appearance, because then you pay them money to buy their product, right? <laughs> so they don't want you to be happy, they don't want you to have content and peace about the outward things, and uh, none of those things I've mentioned uh, are bad, of course, nothing wrong with trying to be healthy and taking care of your body, that's, uh, I think, a good thing. But if we only focus on the outside, if we only focus on the superficial, then we will become superficial. 
Okay, and it's that inner person. It's the person who dwells within the tent, who dwells within the body. Uh, that's the person who's going to continue on when this tent disintegrates. When this tabernacle, to use the language in verse 1, when this tabernacle is dissolved. And then what's going to happen from that point onward? The Bible says we have the hope one day that we're going to receive this, this new building from God that's eternal in the heavens. Uh, let me leave you with this last passage, Psalm 90. And in verse 10, the Bible says, The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away.